to ask our last uh, scholar to talk about GRE. Dan Brunthorpe is the director of Asian Study at the uh, American uh, Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on the East Asian security issues and uh, China-American relations. And Dan uh, was, uh, went to George uh, Washington University. No? Washington. Washington University. And then um, he went to uh, John Hopkins and then went to Duke. Uh, John Dan Head is a very influential scholar. Um, he had uh, once, back in 19, 2008, 2008 uh, he was on the the uh, campaign team of uh, uh, McCain on so the presidential meets, and he was here at that time. I remember we had a long discussion with uh, with him, and without uh, spending too much time about him, I believe uh, most of people met him before, and I believe he has some new uh, thoughts want to bring to us uh, today. So let's. Uh, I welcome Tom. Um. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the Taiwan Center and uh, Dr. Lin for uh, hosting this uh, very important forum. And I'm privileged to be here with, um, with the other speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Wong and, and Dr. Lin. Uh, and thank you all for, for coming today. I wanted to discuss uh, five, five different things. Uh, uh, first, to answer the, the, one of the main questions that was posed uh, to me in, in uh, accepting this invitation, and that is, uh, has the Title I uh, Relations Act worked? And uh, the answer is yes. So let's move on. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's a yes, but. Is, is the answer. The thing, second thing I wanted to discuss is the but piece of it, which is times are times are changing uh, rapidly, both in terms of China's growing power and influence, as well as the uh, new geopolitics in terms of the ferocious return of revisionist states such as Russia, China. Uh, and Iran, and the way the U.S. Is, is dealing with them or not dealing with them. The third issue is uh, also in the category of, yes, it's working, but, however, uh, you, there are questions related to both U.S. power and capacity and will, as well as the very uneven application of the TRA. Uh, the fourth series of, of, of issues is, uh, is Taiwan doing its part uh, in, in terms of uh, making it easier to implement the Taiwan Relations Act. And finally, I want to say something about the news of the day, the, the protests and, and the, the sunflower movement and, and what role the TRA and, and, and other policy levers the U.S. has, has to play in, in so first, uh, I agree in large measure with what Dr. Wong laid out, which is, yes, the, the TRA uh, has, has worked in the sense that uh, if you look at the early Kissinger Nixon transcripts about, uh, about the future of Taiwan, Kissinger was quite explicit with Joe and Lai that he believed that Taiwan would just disappear after a decent interval. Uh, in his words, and obviously that has not happened. Not only has it not disappeared, it's thrived. And I think Dr. Wong has, has, has uh, articulately explained that. It's, it's not just because of the TRA. I would argue that, that the long period of, of peace in Asia from 79 until now uh, had a lot to do with the decision by the United States to continue to deploy a lot of military power into the region and stay, stay present in its forward basing and, uh, and in its uh, diplomatic relations. 
I would say some of it had to do with decisions made by Deng Xiaoping about about how he was going to approach China's modernization for that period of time. Uh, a lot of it had to do with just the entrepreneurial spirit of, of the people in Taiwan and elsewhere, both to build up their economy from nothing, as well as to uh, make a peaceful transition to democracy, which has garnered more sympathy and support in the United States than, than during the time of the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, so I would say that we sit here 35 years later in 2014, uh, when in 79 and 80 and 81, uh, many people thought that Taiwan wouldn't, wouldn't make it at all. And perhaps that was even the thinking uh, of Henry Kissinger to a certain degree. Uh, and, and it has made it. And, and it's made it very well. It has a large degree of independence. And it's not perfect, obviously, in terms of what most people in Taiwan want. But it has a large degree of, of independence. It's thriving economically, even though obviously, like every other industrialized country, it's not thriving as much as it once was or wants to be. Uh, and it is a thriving, peaceful democracy, uh, with, with now a few transitions of, of presidential power. Uh, so yes, it, it has worked, and and. Not, not only, not by itself, uh, these other policy decisions and, and strategies that the United States had in Asia as a whole have contributed greatly to Taiwan's um, status and, and increased status in many ways. Uh, but Taiwan relations actually certainly had a role to play. And, and I also would say that, as Dr. Wong alluded to, it kind of uh, resulted from the best of United States system in the sense that the normalization process both under Kissinger and Nixon and, and Ford and, and uh, you know, Ford and Kissinger and Carter and Brzezinski was a very sloppy process I think. We're still coming to terms with how many mistakes they made during that process and, and probably uh, if they had pushed a little bit harder uh, there could have been two, two Chinas or one Taiwan or one, one China during time, or at least dual recognition of the, of the United Nations, like Germany and so on, but they didn't, and it's a whole book could be written on the sloppiness of the normalization process. Um, but then we go to, okay, so it has uh, worked in the sense, it, it's the best in the United States in the sense that Congress essentially revolted against the administration's policy, as Dr. Wong said, uh, and uh, both activists States and in Taiwan uh, pushed hard, and the legislation ended up being a lot stronger than what the executive branch wanted. And, and that that really is uh, that really is the best of the United States system. It's when the executive branch is making uh, deals in secret and making mistakes, uh, the Congress is able to play its co-equal role uh, and wrangle some. Uh, it won't make be the decisive factor foreign policy, but it certainly can shape foreign policy in very decisive ways. Okay, so we got to the yes part, now we get to the but however part. Times are changing, right? So China is far more powerful and far more prominent than it was when uh, the TRA was, was passed. And that power and prominence, prominence has been translated into greater ambition and a greater sense of arriving in a greater sense of, of status and wanting more in the world. And, and Taiwan is obviously badly affected by that in, in the sense both of the, the unrelenting coercion, I would say. <coughs> if, you're, if you're living uh, across, this, across from 1,400, 1,500 missiles, you're basically living with a gun pointed to your head. So, the coercion is every day, it's unrelenting, and in that sense, the, the passages of the Taiwan Relations Act that people here have read about uh, resistant coercion have not been evenly uh, applied or, or, or countered. Uh, but China's playing a much bigger role and it's forcing all countries
countries to recalculate their, their strategies and policies with, with respect to China. Um, and, and I think it's also, there's a lot of confusion. So I, the, um, forget, forget some of the professors uh, that Dr. Wong mentioned in particular, I would dismiss out of hand people like John Mearsheimer, who has no, I mean, you can round it up to zero influence on policymakers. Uh, they dismiss him. I mean, here, here's a guy who has been wrong on every policy call. He argued in the early 1990s that Europe would rise as a counterbalance to the United States. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but, but the policymakers, the, 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 the ex policymakers that have been mentioned, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of strategic thought on the United States. I don't mean, I don't mean policy and reactiveness and so on, but real strategic thought of what Taiwan actually means in the United States strategy in the Asia Pacific. And that's a very strange thing because China has given it an unbelievable amount of strategic thought. If you read Chinese naval strategists and if you read uh, the father of the Chinese, the modern Chinese Navy, Admiral Liu, Liu Pao Ching, uh, Taiwan figures very prominent, prominently in China's feeling that it's bottled up by the what they call the first island chain, and it needs to be an ocean-going navy and go to sea, and Taiwan is the center of gravity for a breakout into the Pacific. You don't have to believe me, you just read what the Chinese strategists say. And the US is all over the map on that question. Is Taiwan important strategically? I mean, but it's not even all over the map. I don't think, I don't think that the, the policymakers referenced have even given it a thought. I mean, uh, we wake up one day and and there's no war, but but Taiwan is unified with China. I mean, is that really in our interests? Yeah, there's all kinds of reasons why the answer would be no. One would be we're completely reliant on the U.S.-Japan alliance for our position in the Asia Pacific, and Japan uh, would be in a terrible strategic position. Uh, because it would lack, it would it would give up strategic depth, and China would be able to use Taiwan ports and airfields to threaten uh, Japan on the Ryukyu Island chain. The U.S. would have a much harder time tracking Chinese vessels as they as they went from their ports out into the Pacific. Uh, the Asia Pacific could be split in half because of Taiwan's position geographically between Southeast Asia <coughs> and Northeast Asia. Uh, so some of these comments by policymakers and, and, other, and, and others just seem very flip, not well thought out. Uh, and, 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 and for some reason, the US in the policy and strategy area is just not giving a lot of intellectual time and energy to what it would actually mean for geopolitics and the balance of power if Taiwan was unified with China, especially as China is Currently constructed authoritarian China with its its uh, very competitive and rivalrous views of the United States. Uh, so uh, I, I'm very troubled more by by the lack of, of real strategic thought given to the importance of Taiwan. Uh, the new geopolitics. Uh, well, you know, Russia just uh, annexed Crimea, and the U.S. essentially didn't answer it. And uh, we had the State Department testify this week that China is very deterred by the U.S. response to Russia so that it can't, quote, pull a Crimea uh, on Taiwan. But deterred by what? Uh, I mean, Crimea is annexed. And then, <clears throat> and, and Russia got what it wants. What, what does the U.S. government think? What kind of lessons do you think China's learning from that? that they can annex a state and then be softly sanctioned so they, they don't annex another one? I mean, it seems absurd to me uh, that someone would say that. Uh, on top of that, the, the same official who testified could bring himself to reaffirm the six assurances. So it's a, it was the worst of both worlds. The six assurances are another deterrent. So first you talk about, uh, you're kind of deluding yourself into, into thinking that 
that China is somehow deterred by strong and aggressive U.S. responses to Russia, and then you and then you can't mention the six assurances as U.S. policy. And you know, you, sometimes you can't tell whether this is deliberate or just you know, why did it is, or someone trying to be clever. Uh, but it doesn't send a good message, uh, not at all. Uh, so my third point, after times are changing. And, change in geopolitics is, is the question of U.S. power and will, and this question of the capacity for the United States to itself um, resist coercion of Taiwan in, in the Asian Pacific. Well, uh, the last four years have seen a decimation of the U.S. defense budget, absolute decimation of it. And, and, you know, it's, Chinese aren't stupid. They can see that, that we talk all the time about how we are moving more ships, 60% of our fleet into the Pacific, all the rest of it. But 60% of 100 is one thing. 60% of 60 is I'm not, a, not a mathematician, but it's still less. Uh, so, uh, again, delusional uh, when we talk about the, these kinds of things. So the question of just U.S. capacity and power uh, is an open one. And which way is the United States going to go? Are we going to have the political leadership that reverses these decimating cuts? It's not just a question for Taiwan. All our allies are asking this question. Or are we not? And we're at a crossroads with respect to that issue. Uh, and, and as much as... Um, as Dr. Wong said, there are people and personnel who understand the Taiwan Relations Act and positions of power. Uh, I would say two things. One is that this hasn't necessarily led to better application of the Taiwan Relations Act. And the other one is, if they're not concerning themselves with the Sin Kwan An, which is the, the basis of U.S. power, then the Taiwan Relations Act doesn't much matter. Can't be, can't be executed. Uh, so we have a law on the books. Uh, the executive branch, uh, I mean, it, there's a lot of blame to go around, but certainly in the last five years, certainly in the last four years, uh, certainly in the last seven years, there hasn't been a single new arm sales in Taiwan, not one. I mean, the current administration talks about how there was a massive arm sale in 2011, but that was just left over from, uh, with the exception of the upgrade of the ABs. F-16 ABs, which was a lesser, lesser than what should have been done, which is a sale of new F-16 CDs. Uh, everything else that was given to Taiwan was essentially left over from what George W. Bush did to in 2001. So there hasn't been a single new arms sale. Uh, and if you really want to stop the coercion uh, of Taiwan, then make an announcement and say that Taiwan is open, you're open to Taiwan entering the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. It's very easy. Uh, the, the, um, Taiwan is, yeah, there are a lot of problems in Taiwan's economy as well as increasing its liberalization, uh, no doubt about it. But it's, it's, it's starting from a much better point than Vietnam. Uh, so if, if, you're really, if you're really serious about economic coercion, then open up those negotiations to Taiwan. Um, and that just has happened. I haven't seen a single new policy initiative uh, on Taiwan in years. Not, not a one. Uh, so that's not even an application. Now for the Congress, uh, they're supposed to oversee this law. So why isn't there investigation over investigation of whether the law is being faithfully carried out. That's, that would be a recommendation of mine to Congress. Why isn't there a Government Accountability Office uh, report on is the Taiwan Relations Act being carried out by the executive branch? There's reports on every other thing. Uh, you know, the Congress is constantly investigating and requiring reports. So why isn't that happening? Uh, finally, uh, the issue of, of the protests and the Sunflower Movement and, and what the U.S. can do. I mean, so uh, to me, and, and, 
as an American, the way I read these protests, a long time coming, uh, shouldn't have been a surprise in, in, in that the people of Taiwan are, you know, there's always a proximate cause, just like in the Arab Spring, there was a, the proximate cause was, was this um, peddler setting himself on fire because he was personally uh, humiliated, but it, obviously there was a lot more uh, pent up anger and frustration than just that. But here, you know, I think the key piece of anger and frustration is, is about China's coercion and China's long standing policy of isolation uh, and the feeling that Taiwan is going to get sucked in one way or another to China's orbit. Uh, peacefully, meaning without a shot being fired, but still. Uh, the other, of course, has to do with um, you know, the, the other issues of, of transparency in the Taiwan government and, 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 and unhappiness with, with perhaps a, a policy that has gone too far in one direction vis-a-vis -vis China. But you know, I, I, I will also say the U.S. has a big responsibility in this. And the U.S. can change the dynamic. So, you know, the, the, the deal as I understood it early on uh, in President Ma's administration with respect to the United States was President Ma was going to be more conciliatory and less provocative in the eyes of the United States than Chen Shui Bien. Now, the second part of the bargain for the United States was the U.S. was going to be much more forthcoming with things like deepening economic ties through trade agreements uh, with Taiwan and arms sales and cabinet level visits, which we haven't done since the Clinton administration. But the U.S. has not kept its end of the bargain. It just hasn't. And so, uh, there aren't a lot of options for, for Taiwan uh, 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 government officials in any party under those conditions. You know, if, if, if the U.S. isn't opening up other options to, to Taiwan, then government officials have one option, and that's China. And so uh, the U.S. can change this dynamic fairly quickly by giving Taiwan the breathing space and reassurance that it can have a fine and stable relationship with China and benefit economically, like all of us are, but it's not going to be forced to unify. It's not going to be sucked in. It's going to be part of the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. You know, and it, this doesn't seem like rocket science to me. I'm not a social scientist, you know, uh, so maybe I don't have the data. But it seems like, you know, to me that would be easy. Can, you, you can go out and, and give Taiwan government and political leaders options. Uh, and, and then, you know, you won't have, uh, you know, protests on the streets uh, for, for a very long period of time. So I just, you know, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't understand it, and I don't think the U.S. is thinking this through uh, at all. And I don't think the U.S. is thinking through its interests uh, either. So, uh, I guess I started on an optimistic note. Uh, I, I believe the Taiwan Relations Act will be here in five years, in ten years, and uh, I hope to be back in California during those times because it's just beautiful here, and especially after the winter we had in Washington. And I went to a Dodgers game yesterday, and it was just great. Anyway, um, the but but that's maybe not the main question. I think the main question is is what will the U.S. do in terms of its global leadership? And can we turn this around? Will the American people demand that we turn this around? Will we continue to play the role of prime actor in international affairs? Will we check China, not just on Taiwan, but uh, throughout the Asia Pacific on all our other allies? Uh, and this doesn't mean, you know, I hope to God, uh, Dr. Lin's not correct on the inevitability of conflict with China that I can think of nothing more devastating to everybody, uh, but including Taiwanese, they would die first, frankly. Um, 
by, by the U.S. rebuilding a balance of power, rebuilding its power, uh, supporting democracies that exist, encouraging individual liberty in, in other places. Uh, and that's the crossroads we're at right now. And that all of you as American citizens uh, can go out there and put pressure on political leaders <coughs> to get their head out of the sand and start pushing back against these revisionist states. And that would that's benefit to take it to Taiwan, possibly in that.